You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. It's not if you're going to get attacked, it's when you're going to get attacked because there's so many different vectors they can hit you at, right? You've got to protect 360, plus you have employees who might do something crazy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. Today, Ben discusses a new Justice Department policy for charging cases under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I've got new guidance from the FTC on student privacy issues. And later in the show, my conversation with Andrea Diambra. She is from the Norton Rose Fulbright Law Firm. We're discussing their research on litigation and the privacy landscape. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. All right, Ben, let's jump right into our stories this week. Why don't you kick things off for us here? Mine comes from the Lawfare blog written by Alvaro Marignan, Hmm. uh, and it is entitled Department of Justice Revises Policy for Charging Cases Under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Hmm. It references a new policy manual for the CFAA. If you'll recall, there was a major Supreme Court case in 2021 dealing with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, Hmm. uh, the Van Buren case, and it held that Crimes can only be charged under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if somebody is in a particular area, either a physical area or a network, where they do not have access to be there at all. Exceeding authorized access is defined narrowly, meaning they are in a section of a computer or a section of a network where they have no authorization to be, not that they're using it for a purpose that was not intended. And so the Justice Department needs to adopt their policies to comply with the Van Buren holding. And also, I think they're expressing some sort of policy preference here to limit prosecutions under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Okay. So the most important provision of this new memo is to limit the uh, prosecution of cases under the CFAA to cases where there isn't a good faith security research uh, effort taking place. Hmm. In other words, there's sort of a carve out to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for instances where somebody's accessing a computer, and I'm quoting from the memo here, solely for purposes of good faith testing, investigation, and or correction of a security flaw or vulnerability, where such activity is carried out in a manner designed to avoid any harm to individuals or the public, and where the information derived from the activity is used primarily to promote the security or safety of the class of devices. Hmm. In other words, simply because somebody is on a network or in an area of a network or a computer where they're not supposed to be, the Justice Department as a policy will decline to prosecute if they are convinced that that individual is uh, in that area of the network or computer for, or, or the computer for good faith reasons okay. uh, to promote security, to it do is, security <laughs> research. Is, is good faith a, a legal term of art? Is that defined itself? It is largely defined here in the memo. I mean, it's certainly the, I think what you're getting at is there's kind of a slippery slope here. Well, where yeah, I guess there's, yeah, go on. Every single person <laughs> will say, oh, I was just doing security research. Right. I think the way they're defining it is it has to be research that wouldn't confer any tangible or monetary benefit on the person doing the research hmm. and wouldn't cause any bodily harm or economic harm to any other entity. And I think that's relatively easy to measure. I mean, sometimes there's going to be close calls, but I think in most instances, you can tell when somebody is doing good faith research uh, because they immediately notify companies or organizations of their own vulnerabilities. 
They don't steal data. They don't sell data. And then you have instances where that's clearly not the case. Right. Uh, So I I think this is actually a line where you can properly delineate between good faith research and research that someone might be claiming to be good faith but is done for personal enrichment in some way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. You know, uh, I was thinking of my um, my co-host over on the Hacking Humans podcast, Joe Kerrigan. You know, he's over at Johns Hopkins, and one of his responsibilities there is uh, disclosures to organizations. When the researchers at Hopkins find a vulnerability in some right. system, Joe sort of leads the charge for reaching out and contacting the organization, you know, where, where they found the vulnerability. And he shared with me that sometimes they'll get a nasty gram from legal, you know, from the legal department of that company saying, you know, what are you doing in here? This is a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, Cease and desist. Does this kind of try to put an end to that where, I mean, obviously, you know, the researchers at, at Hopkins, for example, they're they're not up to, to bad things. So they say. Research. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, Joe Kerrigan. Uh, right. Yeah, it does. At least it puts an end to, for the time being, prosecution of those types of cases. Okay. So I think it's a little murky whether it's actually still legal, and I'm putting scare quotes around the word legal, Yeah. Uh, to access networks or systems where you are completely unauthorized to access them for the purposes of doing research. What this memo says is just that it is current Justice Department policy to avoid prosecution on these issues. Uh And that is the discretion of – that is at the discretion of the Department of Justice. That principle comes from the fact that there are a finite number of prosecutors in this country, and there are an infinite number of potential crimes that are being committed at any moment. So one thing that any presidential administration has to do is to set priorities. And so they have these types of memos where they describe what type of activity they will charge, they will prosecute, they will uh, try to obtain convictions, and what type of activity is simply not worth their time or their resources. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing here. What that means is if a new administration comes in with different priorities, they could immediately rescind this Justice Department guidance. Or if there's a change in Justice Department leadership, maybe the landscape change uh, changes and you have people who seemingly were accessing networks for good faith research reasons but ended up stealing data or uh, profiting monetarily. Right. Then certainly this document could be rescinded. But this Mm -hmm. is just – a statement of the Department of Justice of their own values and their own intentions as to what they're going to prosecute. I'll also say they limit it even more than the good faith exception. Elsewhere in this memo, they kind of outline instances where it would actually be worth the time and effort and resources of the Department of Justice to prosecute a case under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Hmm. And for that, they consider things like the sensitivity of the affected computer system, the information stored on that system, whether the damage to the system or the information transmitted raises concerns related to national security, uh, foreign terrorism, et cetera, whether the activity is in furtherance of a larger criminal enterprise, so part of a conspiracy, the impact of whatever the crime is on the victims. What this language says to me is they just do not have the resources, wherewithal, or policy desire to use the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as a giant hammer Hmm. uh, to prosecute literally every case where somebody stumbles into a network where they're not authorized to be. Based on the Van Buren decision and based on the Justice Department's own values, they're deciding that they're going to limit the number of cases they're going to prosecute by having this good faith exception and by even beyond that, limiting cases where you have victims that have suffered monetarily or have had bodily injuries or instances where national security is implied. So it's it's just going to be a much narrower set of cases for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. To me, this means we're never going to see a case like the Van Buren case again. And that hmm. makes sense, obviously, since uh, Van Buren won at the Supreme Court. But the type of case where some law enforcement officer has access to the network for law enforcement purposes and they use it to get personal information on an ex-girlfriend or something. I think based on these guidance and these documents, it's far more likely that cases like that will be prosecuted. Hmm. To what degree do you think this is a 
a result of a lot of the the blowback from things like the Aaron Swartz case. Um, can, just real quick, can you describe for our listeners who may not be familiar what that was about? Sure. So Aaron Swartz was a computer programmer and a researcher. And as part of his work, I believe it was at MIT, yep. uh, he was a hacktivist. And he was arrested by the MIT police on breaking and entering charges after he went into a closet to download academic journal articles from JSTOR, right. which was a database used by a lot of lawyers uh, and and other uh, professionals to do research. So there was an unlocked closet that had, uh, I, sp- I guess, a network access port in it. And he found this closet and he plugged his laptop into the into the closet to gain access to MIT's network to download all of this information. Right. Uh, so he claimed that he was doing this as a hacktivist for internet research purposes to expose this vulnerability. But the federal government charged him under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They were seeking a pretty large penalty, $1 million fines. Yeah, felony charges. Felony charges, a significant uh, prison sentence. And he couldn't agree to a plea bargain. I mean, they were really bringing the full hammer, the full force of their prosecutorial authority under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act on this individual, Aaron Swartz, who at least by all appearances was engaging in this activity for good faith reasons. And Aaron Swartz ended up taking his own life. It was incredibly tragic. Mm. Um, I think the entire field and the entire industry hasn't been the same since this happened. I think it has caused prosecutors and policymakers to rethink what the purpose is of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Yeah, This is where I think we might bring in a little bit of originalism. What did the lawmakers who drafted the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the 1980s intend for it to do? And it was to prevent people from trespassing on somebody else's computer and networks to steal information, to enrich themselves, or to cause bodily harm. It's pretty clear in the debate on that legislation that that was the purpose. And to extend that to apply to efforts where seemingly there has been good faith research, I think this document kind of explicitly and implicitly acknowledges that that is just a misuse of the authority of the Justice Department. So I don't think you can talk about this document without understanding the context of the Aaron Swartz case. It's been, what, ten, almost 10 years now? Yeah, 2013 was when uh, he passed. So, yeah, almost almost a decade. And, and since then, there's been a couple of attempts at legislation that have been referred to as Aaron's Law, um, and they've, they, you know, they haven't made it through. They've stalled in committee. They've, you know, typical, I suppose, these days story of things trying to make their way through Congress. But there have been efforts by some legislators, bipartisan efforts, I'll add, to kind of address this. And so I wonder if this is in part a way to respond to those desires, those pushes. I think it is. I mean, we were just talking before we got on. This policy document should almost be titled after Aaron Swartz, I think, Hmm. um, because I think it reflects the Justice Department's recognition that using the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to seek large penalties on good faith researchers is, you know, I think you could argue whether it's morally wrong or not. I I tend to think it is. But also just a misuse of Justice Department and federal government resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's not an area that the Justice Department wants to exercise authority. Uh, So I think it certainly informs what they're trying to do with this policy document. It's interesting, too, as as I think about it, and and I'm thinking off the top of my head here, but if you think about everything that's happened in the past decade in terms of the ascension of ransomware, you know, like federal prosecutors are a lot busier with other things with much greater consequences than they were a decade ago. Yeah, I think, right? <laughs> I figure if you are a Justice Department attorney yeah. who is well versed in computer crimes, yeah. computer fraud and abuse act cases like this are going to be the least of your concerns. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're just better better ways to use the expertise of those attorneys, like the ways you say. I mean, we have ransomware cases that are certainly under federal jurisdiction. And there's a really important policy rationale behind prosecuting those cases, whether they are rogue actors or representatives of nation states. Yeah. And it's not just ransomware. I mean, denial of service attacks, 
what we saw in the 2016 election with uh, interference. Right. Good old-fashioned espionage. Exactly. Um, So those types of things, I think the Justice Department would say that's more worth their time and resources than trying to use the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to crack down on good faith research. Yeah. All right. Well, it's an interesting story for sure. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, My story this week uh, comes from the Inside Privacy website over at InsidePrivacy.com. This is a story written by Jenna Zhang and Lindsay Tonsager, uh, and it's titled FTC Unanimously Adopts Policy Statement on Education Technology and COPPA. Uh, So earlier in May, the uh, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, unanimously adopted a policy statement for educational technology vendors, their ed tech vendors. Uh, And this is reminding them of their duty to comply with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPPA. And uh, specifically, they're saying that uh, they have a a couple of elements here they need to focus on. They include the prohibition against mandatory collection of data. Uh, They have some data use prohibitions some data retention prohibitions, and some data security requirements. What do you make of this, Ben? So first of all, it's encouraging to see this was adopted unanimously. There's a lot Mm. of contentious issues that come in front of the Federal Trade Commission. Yeah. uh, And it seems like there is widespread recognition that we need to make the most of the tools that we have under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. Uh, This law was enacted in 2020, or I'm sorry, in 2000. Uh, so it's now going on 22 years. It was last revised in 2013, Hmm. and it was designed to prevent the exploitation of children, not just from ed tech vendors, uh, but from really all internet-related entities, Uh, so private companies, organizations, uh, et cetera. I think there are a couple of reasons why ed tech uh, has become a greater concern over the past several years. One is that we had this period of extended online learning where education technology uh, was more closely ingrained in the everyday lives of students across the country right? and had more access to potentially personal information because students, even to go to school, had to have login info, uh, things that could be exploited by bad actors wishing to sell that type of data. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's one reason. I just think these companies have become more ubiquitous. Uh, even beyond the period of online learning during COVID, as they've gotten into public schools, private schools, provide tools to students and their teachers. Right. So I think that is the motivation behind these regulations. Uh, So what do these regulations do? You talked about uh, the prohibition against mandatory collection of data. These companies cannot force students to disclose more personal information than necessary as a condition of student participation in an educational activity. Mm -hmm. So collect only the bare minimum that uh, you would need from a student to allow them to use the educational tool. Right. Data use prohibitions, if the vendors are relying on the school itself for the collection of personal information, they can only use that information to provide an educational service. They can't sell it. Uh, They can't use it for any commercial purpose, not for marketing, not for advertising. They can't, even if the data is anonymized, the education tech company would be prevented from saying, we have a profile of a 13-year-old student with X demographic characteristics, and we've seen that they display this type of behavior. This is how you should advertise to them. So it's off limits. It is off, It is fully off limits under these regulations. Okay. Uh, and this means that they can't use any children's personal information as part of any algorithm or commercial database, hmm. uh, which kind of cuts against the bread and butter of most of these tech companies who make their money uh, by collecting information. Uh, yeah, like and, this. and uh, I mean, is this is it fair to say this is the reason why so many platforms like Facebook, for example, you know, say you must be over 13 to join our platform? To, 100%. To, to get them, even though they don't really enforce that in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> yeah, they do not want to get in trouble with COPPA. Right. It is sort of funny that we have pretty robust data privacy legislation, but it only applies to people who aren't of voting age. Uh, Funny how that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it shows that we could have a regime of uh, data privacy protection. Certainly uh-huh. there are downsides to it that we've talked about, but it's an active choice that we don't. It's not like COPPA has been deemed unconstitutional. We see that it it really can be enforced and people can have 
more confidence in, uh, at least as it relates to their children, their data not being used for inappropriate purposes. Yeah. Um, and then on retention policies, they can't retain the information longer than necessary to fulfill the purpose of the data collected in the first place. And they have to maintain the confidentiality, security, and integrity of children's personal information. Some of this is just in response to what Congress has demanded the FTC do under COPPA. Um, but I think this extends even beyond what's listed in the 2013 changes to the, the COPPA statute. I think this policy goes further, uh, and I think it's encouraging to see that unanimously the FTC recognizes the need to protect this information. When the FTC does something like this and they they put out a statement like this, is there a is there an unspoken element that they're also going to be focusing on enforcing this? Yes. I mean, I think this is – anytime they put out a statement, it's showing that this is some sort of priority. Right. Uh, and so I don't think the FTC – would be afraid to, and they certainly have the authority to do so, to institute civil fines on companies for violating uh, these policies. Mm. That is well within their purview as an administrative agency. And by putting out the statement, now companies have noticed that these are the regulations. Uh, and you do not want to get in trouble with the FTC for a number of reasons. Uh, <laughs> but the fines can be significant. Uh, yeah. They can be rather hefty. Uh, and some of these ed tech companies aren't the metas and the Twitters of the world. I mean, they're the type of companies that might go bankrupt if they get more than a slap on the wrist uh, from the FTC. Right. So, yeah, I think this is a statement of uh, their priorities uh, and an, uh, an exercise of their authority under COPPA. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story as well in our show notes. Uh, we would love to hear from you. If you have something you'd like us to consider for discussion on the show, you can send it to us. It's caveat at thecyberwire.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCore Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Ben, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Andrea D'Ambra. She is from the Norton Rose Fulbright Law Firm. And we're discussing some research that they all recently did on litigation and uh, its effect on the privacy landscape. Here's my conversation with Andrea D'Ambra. So this report's been going on for 17 years now. It's really the, the longest running survey of its kind. And really, we started it as a way to sort of understand what our clients were seeing from their perspective and and what trends are sort of emerging in in the marketplace. Well, let's dig into some of the highlights here. I mean, what are some of the things that caught your eye? I think the most interesting thing about this is that it it completely tracks what we're seeing on our side of things. It was very validating. One of the big trends is that Cybersecurity and data protection have become really very key legal disputes of most concern. So back in 2019, uh, about 8% of our respondents were saying that they were a legal dispute of most concern. That has tripled in hmm. 2021 to 24%. And in addition, when people are looking at business exposure and, you know, whether they feel more exposed on cybersecurity and data protection or less. Back in 2020, the more exposed percentage was 44%. In 2021, that went to 66%. And that all came out of the sort of 
you know, the people who felt like it was the same or the people that felt like it was less exposed. People who thought it was less exposed, I think are probably delusional, but um, they went from <laughs> 6 to 4%. And the people who felt like, you know, they had the same exposure went from 50 to 30%. So huh. really, I think, and I think there's a lot that goes into that. One, it's absolutely true that that cyber attacks are on the rise, Right. I would say in our practice, um, in 2020, our cyber attacks tripled, and both in complexity and in in numbers. And then in um, 2021, they tripled again. I think that that is being played out in in the marketplace as well. But the other thing is, is that, you know, they're getting a lot of of attention, right? Colonial Pipeline uh, hack and other hacks like that have really sort of brought cyber crime and, and cyber breach to the forefront. So in, in recognition of, of this, what are the folks that you work with? You know, what sort of um, uh, actions are they taking to protect themselves against this reality? A number of different things. I will say um, one of the things that I see almost every um, one of our clients that has a major uh, data breach do immediately after the data breach is look at their um, information governance structure and and start looking at at tranches of data that they can get rid of because you can't steal what you don't have, right? So, Mm. you know, they're really trying to clean that up. For years before this, people sort of, in my opinion, paid lip service to information governance, but didn't always follow through on the, you know, the actual destruction of data. And there were a couple of reasons for that. One is that, quite frankly, you know, they have a day job and not really exciting for them. But also mm-hmm. there used to be, and there is to some extent still, a litigation risk that if you, you know, accidentally destroy data that is um, relevant to some litigation, you could get sanctioned. That risk has has decreased a fair amount once the, in, in 2015, they, they passed these rules that, essentially made it more difficult to sanction somebody if they had a data loss. And this cyber risk of, you know, having people steal data has gotten much bigger. So, you know, I had one client who had data going back to 1998. So they were having to notify former employees back to 1998. And of course, those employees, A, they may not love the company as much as they did when they were working for them. But also, you know, a lot of them were like, well, why do you still have my data? (laughs) That's so old. (laughs) And it also causes some sort of uncomfortable conversations with the regulators, right, who are also really sort of getting on um, the data minimization bandwagon, not only in the EU, where it's been in the news a lot, but also the FTC and SEC have started looking at those, you know, how how much people are over-retaining data. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, do you suppose that we're we're really heading into a time here where people are, are really focusing on keeping their houses in order when it comes to uh, data governance? I do. I've seen in the last two years much more emphasis on that, not just from the people who have unfortunately suffered some sort of um, attack, but also from other companies that are really starting to realize this risk and they're trying to act quickly to, you know, mitigate it as much as they can. Now, there's some data that you have to keep no matter what, but over-retention is something that could be dealt with, and, and a lot of companies are investing in it. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's it's really interesting to, to track how this has changed. You know, I almost think that we, we sort of we went through this period of time where um, it was so inexpensive, you know, practically free to store everything. So why not keep it all forever? Uh, and then this, it's, you could see it shift as, uh, you know, data became less valuable. And I heard some folks describe it as almost being radioactive. You know, if you have too much of it in one place, bad things happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can remember back in, I guess it was 2017, I, I did a presentation on, IG and you know the importance of good IG program. And afterwards, one of the in-house lawyers came up to me and he said, "Well, why should I pay you two hundred thousand dollars to come in and you know fix my IG program? Not that it would cost that much, but nevertheless. <laughs> but uh, 
you know, when, you know, storage is so cheap and, you know, it's not a big deal. And, and you know, at that time, we were really focused on the litigation risk, right? That, you know, if you had data around, um, you might have to look at it in discovery and the discovery costs are bigger. That's one risk, right? But then there's this other cyber risk, which is, for most companies, a much more concerning risk. Can you give us some insights as to what the reality is when it comes to verifying that some that something has actually been deleted? You know, it, it's a conversation that I've heard many times where, you know, there's a difference between a, a paper document, for, you know, can be shredded, can be burned. Can, you, know, there, you could verify that it's gone. Um, but sometimes flipping a switch in a database indicating that something is gone doesn't necessarily mean that it is or that it can't be gotten back. How much does that complicate things, if at all? So one of the challenges in working with electronic data is it is both ephemeral and it lasts forever because a lot Mm. of times there are so many copies out there. I like to call it the Dombra rule, that if you really need a piece of data, you can't find it and you can't get it. And if you <laughs> don't want a piece of data to be around, it's like in 50 different places. Right. Because um, that's always how it seems to be in my practice. But yeah, I, from a cyber um, attack perspective, we don't generally see cyber threat actors going in and, and restoring deleted data. They're mm-hmm. really going in for a quick hit, right? They want to get some data that they can hold hostage and um, and then threaten to publish on the internet and embarrass the company and cause them all sorts of problems so that they can get a, a ransom paid. You know, they're they're much more focused and and they want to do as as little work as necessary. You know, faced with these realities and and you know some of the the enhanced regulations that are coming online and and so forth. I mean, is there a real-world cost to this? Are, are organizations finding that tracking this is becoming a, a cost burden on them? Oh, absolutely. Cyber insurance, which you know many organizations have, um, has gone up significantly in the last few years. You know, investing in IT infrastructure and and good information governance is also a cost, and and even sort of the monitoring and in, in putting in place sort of best practices for um, cybersecurity has a has a real world cost. So definitely, there's a lot of cost involved here. I don't think there's a lot of ways to avoid it, though, in in yeah. our current environment. What is your advice for that business owner? I'm I'm thinking particularly of small and medium sized businesses who are trying to strike that balance, you know, between the risk of litigation, spending a reasonable amount on protecting themselves against this. Any tips on how to go about dialing that in? Well, it's hard, right? Because if you're a small or medium-sized business, you may not have, you know, the ability to put into place all these different security measures. We see a lot Mm -hmm. of those folks go to what's called a, a managed security service provider, and they sort of manage the IT security on their end and then interface with the client. We've had problems with them too, though. I mean, these hackers are very smart, right? So, you know, if they could hack in one of these MSSPs, you know, they don't have to do as much work because they can get into lots of different systems. And, uh, and so there are some challenges there. But, you know, I think it's just a matter of sort of assessing, you know, what data you have. And, and how it could be leveraged and, you know, what can you get rid of and then investing in good cyber insurance and understanding sort of what your policy will give you because that can be, you know, a huge help and ensuring that, you know, you've gotten relationships with the people you would have to work with on a cyber incident before you have the cyber incident. The last thing in the world you want to do is meet your uh, forensic investigator and your lawyer when your hair is on fire and, you know, data is running out the door. But, you know, unfortunately, sometimes there's nothing we can do about that. But we really encourage our clients and uh, and everybody else, potential clients, to get engaged before that happens. You know, we have tabletop exercises where we can sort of run through a, a 
a uh, an event and and you know talk about who's going to be doing what and what's going to be happening, which can be very helpful and sort of identify some weak points in your your whole cybersecurity incident response plan. We also, you know, in some cases, particularly with our larger clients, we actually have relationships with them where we get a feed from their security operations center when alerts come in of a certain level, right? So that mm-hmm. we have they have counsel engaged immediately when when a major event comes along. Where do you suppose we're headed with this? I mean, as you as you say, you you all have been tracking this for nearly two decades now. Do you is there a a, a direction you see things going? I think eventually, this is just one woman's opinion, the governments are going to end up sort of stepping in and leveraging more resources to prevent cyber attacks and also to try and track down the people who are doing them and punishing them, right? Because it it is such a cost on and a drag on our economy. That may not be possible. That might be sort of Pollyanna. But, you know, at the end of the day, we have all these companies out there that are really getting hit hard, you know, and the fact of the matter is, is that no matter how much you spend on cyber, you know, security, it's not if you're going to get attacked, it's when you're going to get attacked because there's so many different vectors they can hit you at, right? You've got to protect 360, plus you have employees who might do something crazy. Whereas our friends, uh, you know, the threat actors, not our friends, but the threat actors really, they can hit you here and then if maybe they try a weak point over here. And, and they can do a lot of social engineering to get what they want. They're very, very good at this sort of stuff. Ben, what do you think? It's amazing how quickly the landscape has changed, not just in the past 10 years, but in the past two to three years. Hmm. The data is really remarkable from these companies showing significant concern about liability. Uh, I think it's from these high-profile incidents, cyber incidents that have happened to companies in, in every sector. But that survey data is is crucial to see where the industry is. It's mm-hmm. Level of concern is a little bit higher than perhaps I, I would have expected. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's really good that they're they're doing this work. Yeah. I mean, it, it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, the we've even you know we, we've you and I have talked many times about how things like insurance policies can can be drivers of or the the expense of insurance policies can drive compliance and right. you know better uh, better security uh, practices. Uh, and this, I think, tracks similarly. It does. And she talks about the newfound need for cyber insurance. I think as people start to recognize their risks and their vulnerabilities, uh, they're going to dip into their financial resources to pay for things like insurance. And that might not have happened two or three years ago. Yeah, I think it's just how profile all of these attacks have been. It's something that seemed very far-fetched when it was even something like uh, the Office of Personnel Management hack, Mm. where that only applied to federal employees. Then it was Equifax, and it was, okay, well, that's that's really most of us. Right. Um, But (laughs) maybe I didn't seek a, a, a credit report, or it's fine if they have that data. There's nothing secretive in there. But when we have something like the Colonial Pipeline incident where... The East Coast of the United States sees gas lines for a period of weeks. Yeah. Uh, or we have these ransomware attacks on local governments. I think it becomes very real for people. Um, they're recognizing it in a way that they didn't one to two years ago. So I think the fast-paced nature of this is is what's really interesting to me. All right. Well, our thanks to Andrea D'Ambra from the Norton Rose Fulbright Law Firm for joining us. We do appreciate her taking the time. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. 
With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening.